I am Dr. Elizabeth Spaulding, Vice Chairman of the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. VOC focuses on remembering all the victims of communism for over a century and counting, and teaching about the destructive and deadly ideology, history, and legacy of communism. I am also founding director of VOC's newest project, the Victims of Communism Museum, located at our Washington DC headquarters. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Dr. Gregory McBrayer is Associate Professor of Political Science at Ashland University. He holds a PhD in government and politics from the University of Maryland and is a VOC core faculty member. Today, Dr. McBrayer will be teaching us about Marxism. Please post your questions to the Zoom chat for Q&A discussion with Dr. McBrayer. And Greg, it's a pleasure, over to you. Thank you so much. It's nice to be with you and welcome to the students as well. I'm going to be lecturing on Karl Marx for you guys. Let's see if I can actually do, oh, wrong way. I've already failed the test. There we go. I'm gonna be lecturing on Karl Marx for you today. So before I do that, I thought it would be worthwhile to take a couple of, of seconds and just kind of try to help you understand what, what my goals are, what I'm, what I'm trying to sort of get across today. So the first thing I'm trying to do is I, I just kind of want you guys uh, to try to understand Marx a little bit on his own term. So we're trying to understand Karl Marx, what he was up to. Related to that, <clears throat> my second point, I suppose, is that I would, I would try to encourage you to take his thoughts seriously. What I mean by that is often, I think, when students, uh, especially Americans, are exposed to Karl Marx for the first time, it's, it's very difficult to see how people could have found this attractive. I admit that I don't find it attractive. Um, and so it's, it's an, sort of an intellectual effort to take some energy to try to see what's attractive in Karl Marx. And I'll try to lay out a little bit of that as we go through. After all, he's persuaded large numbers of people, millions of people, perhaps, or at least leaders of millions of people that communism is the best form of government and that we all ought to have our government formed in that way. I mean, right now in 2022, um, we know that more human beings live under communism than at any point under human history. So it's very powerful in the world and I think we're too quick to dismiss it. I think we ought to try to understand it on its own terms before we try to uh, reach any conclusions about dismissing that, okay? So, that's step one, just to understand Mark. Step two, try to take it seriously. And then the third thing that I would like to try to do is to show the connection between Marx's thought and communism as it was carried out in practice. In other words, I aim to show that much of what you saw in communism in the 20th century and what we continue to see in the 21st century uh, is that communism comes directly from Karl Marx's thought. Often you'll hear communist apologists make the argument that, well, we've never really seen communism tried uh, or the, the, the horrors of communism really don't have any antecedents in Karl Marx's thought. And I'm going to try to show you that the roots are there in Marx's thought for the atrocities that we saw carried out in many communist regimes in the 20th and 21st century under his name. So that's not in fact a departure from his thought there. It's sort of the natural consequence of Karl Marx's political theory political ideology. So those are the three things, just you know, understand Marx, take him seriously. And then I'd like to sort of expose uh, some of the roots of the nastiness in communism that are already present there in the work for which he's probably most famous, uh, the Communist Manifesto. There I have his dates. You'll see that uh, Marx was writing in the 19th century. Uh, he was alive 1818 to 1883. I have the title of his uh, magnum opus, Capital, Capital, excuse me. But then also the, the work for which is most famous uh, and the work that most people would have read, the Communist Manifesto. What is communism? This is probably a place I should start with and I'll try and build to what it means. But in the most simple terms, communism is simply um, the idea that we ought to do away entirely with private property and that all property ought to be owned by everyone, not by anybody individually or in a private capacity. And what this means in effect, of course, is that the government would own all things, especially the modes of production, which means industry, any, any sort of big government, uh, excuse me, any big business, any commercial activity. 
that's going to be owned by the state. So individuals can't own things. And we'll, we'll tr I'll try to lay out why this is uh, why this is the case and why it's connected to some other things that we find so much more problematic in just a moment. So Marx is undoubtedly uh, the most influential communist thinker, and that's why we turn to him. I mean, he's, after all, credited with being the father of communism. He's the guy that wrote the book. He's the guy that wrote the Communist Manifesto. I'll, I'll qualify that in just a moment, but it's important to see that from the beginning. When we talk today, I'm going to focus on the Communist Manifesto, but I'm going to also mention in passing two other works. I'm going to begin with something that he wrote called On the Jewish Question. Then we're going to do the Communist Manifesto, and occasionally I will turn to another short work of his called The German Ideology. If you really are interested after this lecture, as I'm, I'm sure you are, your appetite will be whetted for more Marx, you really want to look at Capital for his economic thought, for his fully fledged out, such as it is, uh, thoughts on these matters. So I'm going to begin with the work of his called On the Jewish Question. This work is basically a response. As I mentioned, Marx is uh, living in Germany, although he, he spends most of his adult life actually later in England. Uh, and in Germany, there's a large number of Jewish thinkers who are arguing that the, that the best hope for Jewish people in modernity is to sort of fully embrace liberal political principles. And by liberal, I don't mean sort of contemporary American political left. I mean liberal in the classical sense, sort of uh, a regime devoted to liberty and freedom and one that respects basic human rights, uh, something like you'd find in the Bill of Rights, toleration, respect for conscience, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, these kinds of things. So there are a number of influential German, German figures in the 19th century argue, who are arguing that what Jews ought to do to, in order to sort of succeed going forward is to integrate themselves into a liberal society, understood in the ways I just mentioned. In, in fact, at the time in Germany, although it was called Prussia at the time, Jews actually did have some restrictions on what they could do. They were, they were um, restricted from engaging in certain commercial activities, for example. Marx's own father, in fact, had been a victim of these laws. So there are these Jewish thinkers advocating for liberalism. And in this piece called On the Jewish Question, Marx lays out why Jews should not place their hopes in a country like the United States of America, for example. The reason I want us to read this short piece, or the reason I'm going to sort of describe briefly this short piece is because this is, I think, the piece where Marx lays out more clearly than he does anywhere else his rejection of the notion that humans have natural rights, human rights. He thinks it's kind of a, a joke, it's a farce, and it's here present in his thought from the beginning. And so we can see that it's, of course, the communist countries that come later and speak in his name are not going to recognize the human rights of people. If they, don't, if they don't recognize that there are such things at all. So here he is, he's, he's going to discuss um, principally actually France's Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. But for our purposes, there's really not much difference between France's Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen and the United States Declaration of Independence. They're both liberal regimes that are trying to declare that man has natural rights. Marx says this is just silliness. Uh, he says there are no human rights that are distinct from rights of citizens. He says, look, these, these French people and these Americans and others, they're, they're trying to convince you that there's this really important thing called human rights, but really all that it boils down to, according to Marx, all that the United States Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, all that France's Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen, all it boils down to is a man's right to own private property, stuff. He says, they can dress it up all they want, but it's really just a defense of making money. So here he's understanding property. I think he's understanding in the way that we have come to understand it, that property simply means your stuff. But I would encourage you to look back at, actually James Madison wrote something called Of Property. And John Locke, the very famous English philosopher who gave rise to the Declaration of the Constitution, talks about property. And Locke is emphatic that the first property right you have, that which is most properly yours, hence the term property, is you. You own your conscience. You own your body and you own your labor. And then only last, do you own the stuff that you sort of mix your labor with? So it's important to note that for Locke, the very first thing you own is, is you, your freedom of conscience and your body. And this is, by the way, why. So here is, here's Mark saying, you don't have that right. You do not own yourself. You do not own your conscience. And so you can see already here, it's latent, it's implicit, it's not explicit, but you can see why we wouldn't need a regime to sort of respect freedom of conscience. 
we wouldn't need a regime to respect the ownership of your own body. Okay, so Marx thinks that capitalist regimes, this is a Marxist term, capitalist regimes, all they care about is people making money and it describes people as what he calls self-sufficient monads, which like so robots basically. He's like, you guys are talking about people as though they were just these little selfish robots who are only concerned with their own well-being. And he says, and that's just not correct. Uh, in fact, people aren't selfish. We'll get to this in just a moment, but he's going to radically disagree with our conception, the liberal conception of what um, uh, human nature is. Related to that, another problem he points out in the Jewish question is that according to Marx, liberalism, and this is actually accurate, I think, Liberalism denies that man is by nature a political animal. So it, it abstracts from politics. You'll, you, may you may remember that I mentioned that the French declaration is called rights of man and citizen. This implies that there are human beings before there are citizens, that we come together in what's called a social contract and we make citizens out of one another. And according to Marx, there is no such place. There is no distinction between man and citizens. Man everywhere is a citizen. There's always power. Now, if there's always power, if that's what the nature of government looks like, then we don't have to ever come together and, and sort of place limits on what kind of government we might make. There's just different forms of power structures. Maybe we can tease this out in a little bit, but the idea is that man everywhere and always is under power. There's never a time when we came together and decided, you know what, let's make a government. Uh, Marx, I'm not going to read this quote, but at the end of On the Jewish Question, uh, Marx says that liberalism denies our status as species beings. I'm, I'm reading this because this is a strange turn of phrase. Mark, re Marx refers to human beings as having a species being. Well, I would say human nature. I imagine you would say human nature. I, I'm only bringing this up to point out that Marx does not, he's not, a, he's not of one mind on this. But Marx does not speak of human nature. Instead, he speaks of species being. And as, when we turn to the Communist Manifesto, I'll try to make this a little bit clearer. But one of the things that Marx is, Marx is trying to make clear and that I disagree with is that human beings do not have a nature, that we can actually change over time. This is why he, he refuses to speak of human nature and speaks instead of what he calls species being, which I admit, I don't quite understand what it is. All right. I'm gonna turn now to the Communist Manifesto after those brief remarks from on the Jewish question. A lot of times I try to defend why one would read a single work or why you should turn to anything. Why should students care about the Communist Manifesto? And I would just say it's probably the single most influential writing in modernity that has influenced people's political lives, probably rivaled by the Declaration of Independence. This book, the Communist Manifesto, and I have a picture Sure of it in German here on the right, has affected the lives of millions upon millions of people. I should add, it has also affected the deaths upon, of millions upon millions of people. I mentioned at the beginning that the most widely read of, this is the most widely read book of Marx, but it's not his masterpiece. His masterpieces that were called Kapital, which is just capital, hence capitalism. As we turn to the manifesto, I would encourage you to think about it as a kind of analog to the Declaration of Independence in a number of ways. Both the Declaration and the Communist Manifesto aim to have a practical effect in the world. And so each is highly rhetorical. Neither work lays out clearly the principles that undergird their thought. If you think of the Declaration of Independence, which speaks of we hold these truths to be self-evident. It just says we hold them. It doesn't explain where they come from or how they arrived at that reason. You'd have to look somewhere else for that answer. And I think Jefferson, among others, would point you to, say, uh, John Locke's second treatise of government. So in other words, because the, the Declaration of Independence is aimed at a practical sort of thing, it doesn't lay out all of the philosophical justifications for what it's doing. The same thing is true of the Communist Manifesto. The manifesto, as the manifesto kind of sounds like it's trying to make something happen, right? So the same thing is true of Marx's manifesto. If you wanna to try to understand what Marx is really up to, you'd have to look at his more philosophical works such as they are. But this is a practical work. It's very short, it's highly rhetorical, it's passionate, it's trying to have a practical effect. Just some practical detour, details. This was written in 1847 to 1848. If you know your European history, there are a lot of revolutions going on in the 1840s. 
You should also, I'm sure you're well aware that mass industrialization is happening throughout Europe. This book is not written at a high intellectual class. The audience to me seems to be the general public, the working class. This is not an academic work. It's not addressed to intellectuals. It's not even really, I think, ultimately addressed to fellow communists, although they're there too. The intended reader of this book, I think, is the man who has just worked 10 to 12 or even 14 hours as a laborer in an industry. He's tired, he's grimy, he's sweaty. This book is meant to appeal to him. That is to say, it's meant to appeal to a human being who Marx will call the proletariat. This is a really important term for Marx, the proletariat. It's a worker, basically, but a worker of a particular kind, someone who works in industry, someone who, or maybe you um, work in the coal mines or something like this. And, and so because it's aimed at these people who are probably not well-educated and who furthermore don't have really have the time to analyze a text sort of in detail, this book is short and it's passionate. The point I think very quickly is that you're getting hosed. You're not being treated fairly. And part of the persuasion, uh, part of the reason this book is so persuasive, I would say, is that Marx is speaking to a people who are really having a hard time. I mean, think about any presentation you've ever seen in literature or in film of what life was like under the Industrial Revolution. Have you ever read a Dickens novel? I mean, the kids, uh, you know, Oliver Twist, for example, right? It was not a good life. And so here comes Marx, and he's just trying to come out, and he says, look, you guys are not getting a square deal. And I think part of Marx's, the, the power of his persuasion is that it seems correct. Uh, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but uh, his account of things was that they're very, very bad, which if your life was very, very bad, this would, re this would resonate with you. And then he then offers you a way out. I have an idea. Things are really bad. Follow me and we can institute heaven on earth. That I think is pretty, uh, pretty appealing to folks. But before we move on, I would just mention that Marx is not the sole author of the Communist Manifesto. He wrote it principally with his partner Engels, but also with some other folks. Just like, by the way, as I mentioned a moment ago, the Declaration of Independence was written, of course, principally by Thomas Jefferson, but there was a part, there was a, um, a committee of five actually who wrote the Declaration of Independence. And they in turn had been commissioned by uh, the Continental Congress. So you have an organization designating a small group to write something, and then within that small group, somebody takes the lead. And you have the same thing going on here. This is another reason, by the way, like you can't simply read the declaration as though it's Thomas Jefferson's thoughts because the final product is not what Jefferson initially wrote. I hope that you will each at some point in your lives read Thomas Jefferson's first draft of the Declaration of Independence and compare it to the final copy, copy that was published. There are some important changes. And I think that those important changes will help you to understand a great deal about Jefferson, but also the politics of the United States of America in 1776. So similarly here in the Communist Manifesto, Marx, of course, is the chief writer of this, but it's he's writing for a group that have different thoughts. If you've ever worked on a group project in school, you know that the final product, even if you took the lead on it, you know that the final product, even though you put your name on it, you had to make some, you would have done it differently if it had just been you. You had to appease that other kid in class in some way. And so Marx has to do the same thing here. Okay. This is a practical work, just to repeat. It's aimed to produce actual results in the world. I could ask a quiz question right now. Does anybody know what the final words of the Communist Manifesto are? Pause for effect. If, you've, if I'm sure you've heard it before, it's workers of the world unite. That is, it ends with a, with a, a declaration. Uh, it ends with something in the imperative mood in English, right? Do something. It's an instruction. Unite, go do something. It's practical. Marx criticizes earlier philosophers who only sought to understand the world. He thinks that it's, it's not good enough simply to understand the world. You have to actually change things. So this is a political work, it's, it's not philosophic. I think that's important to know. Okay, the Communist Manifesto consists of four parts plus a little introduction. So. I thought I'd begin with just the introduction. 
These are the opening lines of the Communist Manifesto. A specter is haunting Europe, the specter of communism. What's a specter? A specter is a ghost. A ghost is haunting Europe, the ghost of communism. This, this work, this short work, the Communist Manifesto opens with the following lines. A ghost is haunting Europe, the ghost of communism. You think we're a ghost. So I hope the reason I bring this up at the beginning is so that you can see that part of what Marx is trying to do here is he's trying to set the record straight. You've heard us spoken about as though we're a boogeyman. We're a nasty monster in the closet. But I want to tell you the truth. This is what the communists are really about. Okay. So the Communist Manifesto, the main purpose of this short document is to explain who the communists are and what they want, but also to defend themselves against all these allegations that they're nasty people. We'll get to the allegations in a moment. There are three specific allegations that people say these nasty things about us. And I'm going to set the record straight on those things. Okay. Uh, by the way, at the end of the preamble, Mark says, please publish this manifesto in English, French, German, Italian, Flemish, and Danish. Think about what those countries have in common. Think about what countries are missing from that list. Think about the communist countries you know from the 20th and 21st century. Please note those languages aren't on this list. Marx thought that communism would take place in industrialized countries, England, France, Germany, Italy. Where did communism arrive? Well, Russia and China. So Lenin, uh, a later Marxist, and Mao, another later Marxist, are going to do some are going to try to make some changes to the core of Marxism to make it compatible with non-industrial people and also in a particular place. Marx, again, workers of the world unite. Marx thought that communism would be a worldwide phenomenon, not in any way restricted to a particular country. And so it's a curiosity that the communist countries we know arose in particular times and places, the Soviet Union, China, Cuba. It's not what he foresaw. So Marx's goal here is to explain communism. And you see why it's become necessary. In the first place, there are all these different communist organizations. And so the goal here is to unify them and to bring us all together on a few core principles that we can all agree upon. And then the second point is to defend communism from some pretty specific charges, okay? All right, part one, the bourgeois and the proletarians. The title of part one is the bourgeois and the proletarian. Who are the bourgeois and the proletarians? We've got some pretty, we've already tried to define communism. At this point, we probably need to think about defining the bourgeois and the proletarians. I'm gonna give you some rough definitions and rough definitions therefore are imperfect. The, the simplest way to think about it would be the rich and the poor, but that's not quite good enough. The, the wealthy people who own stuff and the workers, okay, that's a little better. Even better still, the bourgeois are people who live in the towns and who own stuff, who have capital, uh, money. They're the people who have the money to start organizations and companies and these kinds of things, the, the bourgeois. Proletarians aren't all poor people, but they're specifically poor people who work in industries in urban areas. So not really farmers and not poor farmers and not poor people who work out in the rural country field, but we really are talking about in an industrialized area, urban area, the rich and the poor, those who own the stuff and those who work, okay? So that's the bourgeois or the rich capital owners, the money people and the proletarians are um, the proletarians are the workers in those things. Okay. Now, the very first sentence I've already read from the sort of introduction, the very first sentence of part one says, the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. I want you to think about what that means for just a moment. Here's one of those places where I said, we see the roots for all the later injustices committed in communism's name. <clears throat> Because here's what I think Marx is saying. The history of all existing societies is the history of class struggles means that all previous societies have been unjust. It also implies that all previous societies have been divided into two different classes and that those classes have fought one another. So all human history, 
is just fighting. Further, he's implying by saying that it's a class struggle that all human conflict has been over economic matters, ultimately money, who has goods and services. Humans don't fight over the noble, the just, the good, the beautiful. Rather, all of our fights are between economic classes over the distribution of goods. So here, here's the thing. The history of the world has just been one class of people oppressing another class of people. That's what history has been. Why should we expect it to be any different in the future? Let me try the following also. Let's just presuppose that you and I would like for there to be peace. We want peace, correct? Yes, of course, I agree. Okay, but all the history of the world has been fighting, right? Yes. And what's been the source of the fighting? Well, class conflict. So what's the easy way to get rid of conflict? Well, you, you just get rid of classes. Yes. And in fact, this is what a lot of communist regimes around the world did in the 20th and still into the 21st century. They deem an entire class of people unacceptable and seek to exterminate them. I hope you can see here the, the beginnings of the logic of a lot of the Soviets uh, and other, other communist attempts to destroy and root out entire classes of people. You saw this in Albania, you saw this all through Eastern Europe, you saw it in China, you saw it in Russia, right? All conflict is because of class conflict. Get rid of class, no conflict. All we got to do is kill these millions of people and then we'll have peace. Problem solved, right? This is Marx's idea. As we move through the text, I'm just going to try and go a little bit through the Communist Manifesto, at least this part. We see that actually Marx has a, a somewhat, I don't know if ambivalent is the right word, but he has a mixed view of the bourgeoisie. On one hand, the bourgeoisie are those who are responsible for all the injustice in the world. On the other hand, they've actually done some pretty awesome things. So Marx's view of history is a little complicated, a little nuanced. The bourgeoisie, he says, actually helped us get rid of feudalism. And that was a good thing. Feudalism is bad. The bourgeoisie has helped us to get rid of patriarchy. Patriarchy is the rule of fathers over wives and over children. And to that extent, bourgeoisie have been very good. Here he even says the bourgeoisie has accomplished wonders far surpassing the Egyptian pyramids, the Roman aqueducts, and Gothic cathedrals. It's conducted expositions, expeditions, excuse me, that put in the shade all former exoduses of nations and crusades. So Marx is saying, if you look back historically, the bourgeoisie have actually done some pretty amazing things. So what's the problem? Why shouldn't we let the bourgeoisie keep going? They've been doing all this amazing stuff. I mean, we put men on the moon for goodness sake. Doesn't that put all former exoduses into the, into the shade? I mean, uh, think of all the amazing things that we've done, all the work we've been able to do with respect to making food available, medicine available. Marx says, that's all fantastic. The problem is you did it all on the back of this enormous class of exploited, oppressed workers, the proletariats. So we've made all this progress thanks to the bourgeoisie and thank you very much, Mr. Bourgeoisie, but your time has come, we have to get rid of you. The bourgeoisie as a class, the capitalists emerged out of feudalism and helped to destroy feudalism. By the same token, bourgeois society is giving rise to the proletariats and the proletariats will get rid of bourgeois society. History is this perpetual working out of one group taking over after another. Um, there's this process, it's a dialectical process, which means like conversational process of working out things over time. The feudal society had its own internal issues, so it gave rise to this being the bourgeois, who is in some way superior, but the bourgeois has its own inconsistencies, it gives rise to these proletariats. And the proletariats are finally gonna help us slough off the bourgeoisie, and we're gonna create the world classless state. So according to Marx, and here is the most complicated uh, sort of term I'm going to use today, and I do apologize, it's a little complicated, but I'm going, to try and, I'm going to try and break it down so you can understand it. According to Marx, Marx believes in something called dialectical materialism, and it's his theory, his scientific theory, he says, of history. History, according to Marx, works itself out in a clear order. We hear this sometimes today, you hear people talk about the arc of history.
as though there's some kind of order guiding it. Marx believed that. But he also believed that it was this working out of things over time, principally the things being worked out were the material working out of the modes of, excuse me, the, the working out of the material conditions. That's not very, it's not very helpful. I'm gonna give a couple of examples and then try to make a little more sense of it. So what Marx is basically saying is that the way that we live and eat, the way that we produce things, the way that we consume things radically affects what types of human beings we are. It determines actually what kinds of human beings we are. So here I have two examples that I, I hope will bring out what Marx is trying to say. Uh, and then if not, maybe, maybe in the question and answer period, I can try to help it a little more. Many of your parents, or if not your parents, your grandparents, when they had to write papers for school, they wrote them on typewriters. You, to the extent that you have to write papers, I hope you're writing them on word processors. So if I'll, I'll just ask you the question, think to yourself, what happens if you've written a paragraph and you notice upon completion of that paragraph that you've misspelled a word, what do you do? You're like, uh, well, Mr. McBride, that's very easy. I just go click on it and right click on it. And then it tells me how to spell it correctly. And I make the change and move on. Very good. And you can keep going. Well, back in the olden days, when I was learning how to write, I had to write on a typewriter. And you know what you did if you realized that you had mistyped or misspelled a word? You had to start all over. Now, what would that do to how you wrote papers if that's how you had to write papers? If you had to write, if you had to start over every time you made a mistake, don't you think you might write a little more carefully? Don't you think you might take a little more time? Marx would say that the material condition, typewriter versus computer, is changing the way that you write. Therefore, it's changing the way that you think. I mean, think about just right now, you and I are, are sort of corresponding via Zoom. How much different would this class be if I could see your faces and see your reactions and build off of them and read passages together? And instead of me reading Marx, asking one of you to read Marx, it'd be different. I'll give one final example on this before we move on, before I try to bring it back to Marx. How do you listen to music? How do you watch videos? When your parents first started listening to music, they probably listened to what are called records. Uh, I think they're now called vinyl because that makes them sound much cooler. I'm not sure it is cooler, but that's to make it sound cooler. And you probably listen to music on your phone. And you're like, what's the, well, who cares? What's the difference? It's still music is music. Yes, that's true to an extent, but albums are big. They're like this, they're bigger than my head, yes? And when I was young, you had to get up and physically change the record if you wanted to listen to uh, music. And so therefore you didn't change music a lot. Like you couldn't just skip the way that you guys can skip what you're listening to if you're listening to Spotify or something like this or Amazon music. And so as a result, musicians in the seventies and even into the eighties, they tried to make an album as a kind of whole, like 10 to 12 songs, coherent theme, because they knew that people didn't want to get up and have to change albums. So they tried to make something you could sit there and listen to for 45 minutes to an hour. Now that it's easy to sort of quickly switch back and forth between artists or songs or whatever, it changes the kind of music that is being produced. Back then, artists tried to produce coherent albums. Now I think people are trying simply to produce a single that will catch your eye. Furthermore, back when albums, which are expensive to produce, where the primary mode of listening to music, you had to get a record contract with a record company to make physically make those. Now, anybody, anybody, you can make a song, upload it to TikTok or YouTube, and someone can listen to it. So the costs of, of producing the music have gone radically down. What's that done? It's greatly democratized music. So the, the typewriter example and the music example are trivial examples, but it's trying to get you to see part of what's persuasive about Marx. The way that you think about if your parents, maybe you're not thinking about this, think about your grandparents. Like think about how are you, I'm sure you've gotten frustrated with how untechnically savvy they are or how technically unsavvy they are, right? You're like, oh, they don't know how to do this. How, gosh, grandpa, let me just do it for you. Why is that? It's because your brain has been wired differently because you grew up in a different time when the modes of production were different. This is part of Mark's persuasiveness, I think. Um, now, I think that cell phones and typewriters and computers aren't very interesting. What does this have to do with Marx? Marx is, is concerned about small things like this, but he's much more concerned with bigger things. What if your job was 
farming versus your job is sitting at a desk typing, you're going to be a profoundly different kind of human being. The mode of production, what you do for a living and how you do what you do for a living profoundly shape us. Marx says it determines us. Therefore, we're not free, by the way. The material modes of production produce certain types of human beings, certain types of relationships, certain patterns of behavior. And so if you, if I took you and I could put you in a time machine as a baby and, and zap you to the 1500s, you would turn out entirely different. And that's what Marx is saying. Because how we produce stuff makes different kinds of people. And here's one of its famous quotes from a work called The Poverty of Philosophy that's meant to bring this out. He says, we had feudalism when we had the hand mill. So there's the mode of production was a hand mill. Once we went to steam power, that just changed completely the relationship between people. And it changed who we are as people. This is connected to one of the other things I was talking about a little bit ago that Marx doesn't think that there's anything sort of permanent about human nature over time. We change radically depending upon what kind of economic situation we live in. We're determined, we're unfree. Like the hand mill gives you that kind of a human being. The steam mill gives you that kind of a human being. We're unfree. And if we're radically unfree, you can see why Marx isn't too concerned that our political system recognizes our freedom. If we're determined by our political and economic situation, one is less concerned with freedom. Okay, to return to the text. So over the course of history, working itself out in this dialectical manner, eventually the bourgeois are gonna create so many proletariats, because right, they're just chugging along, chugging along, making more money, making more money, making more money. And, they're, and they need more and more people to work and work and work, do these things. They're gonna be more and more and more and more proletariats, and they're gonna become more and more and more and more miserable. And eventually all these immiserated, miserable proletariats are gonna get sick and tired of being exploited by the bourgeois. And so the bourgeois are forging the weapons that brings death to itself. We are, the bourgeois are creating the proletariats and the proletariats are going to overthrow us. It's gonna happen, Marx says. Marx explains that modern society is bringing about the impending, its own impending doom at the hands of the working class. So that's what Marx thinks is going to necessarily happen over the course of history. In the next part of the text, Marx attempts to show that communists are the true allies of the proletariat. So I've already, part one, right? Proletariats and bourgeois, part two, proletariats and communists. So part one says, look, there are these two classes. Part two says, we communists are on your side. Not the capitalists, not your fellow countrymen, but we communists are on your side. And to this point, I mentioned earlier that Marx is gonna to try to defend the communists against uh, claims that they're sort of up to some nasty stuff. So if you look at the beginning of part two, Marx says, people are out there saying all these nasty things about us. They say, we wanna get rid of private property. They say, we wanna get rid of the family. And they say, we wanna get rid of nations. And to this, Marx says, I have, I've got an answer, guys. And Marx's answer is actually, yeah, we do wanna get rid of private property. We do wanna get rid of the family and we do wanna get rid of nations. And here's why he's going to, he's not denying the charges, I hope you see. He doesn't say, no, 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 we like private property. And he doesn't say, no, 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 we like the family. And, and no, we love the nation. We love, we're good Englishmen and Germans. And no, no, no. He said, no, you're right. We do want to get rid of those things. But here's why. And you people who don't want to get rid of them, you don't realize that these things are bad for you. And so the, with respect to private property, he says, look, the immediate aim of the communists in all of the countries is to get rid of private property. That's the first thing. That's the most important thing. We want to get rid of private property, period. And he says, Look, and by the way, some of you bourgeois out there, some of you capitalists, you're going to complain. And you, here's your complaint. If we get rid of private property, if no one's allowed to own anything, everyone's going to become lazy. No one's going to work hard. And Marx says, I'm going to read his response. Maybe I should actually just summarize his response. He's, Marx says the following. 
He's like, you have this selfish misconception. You believe that all people are like you. Everyone's not selfish. It's just you capitalists who are selfish because you've been programmed to believe that selfishness is good. Humans are not by nature selfish, he says. And, and you do what every ruling class has ever done. You say, you think that everyone else in the world is just like you, and they're not. Marx fairly explicitly denies in this passage that there is human nature. We can make people not be selfish, he thinks. Here again, you see one of the roots for some of the horrors of the 20th and 21st century, trying to root out a part of human nature that might be incapable of being rooted out, a human self-interestedness, to use uh, Smith's term or Locke's term, that humans are concerned with themselves. So Marx thinks that there is no reason necessarily for humans to be selfish. We could educate that out of them. We could turn them into different kinds of human beings. Remember that uh, that quote I, I mentioned from on the Jewish question, he'd, uh, he'd spoken not of human nature, but of species beings. Furthermore, so, so your idea that people become lazy, that's just because you've been raised in bourgeois society. You've been conditioned to believe that. That's not how people actually are. This is to return again to the German ideology. Marx says, conceiving, thinking, and the intellectual relationships of men appear here as the direct result of their material behavior. So that's a complicated way of saying the following. Your mind is not free to think for itself. So the reason you believe what you believe is because you're a bourgeois human being living in bourgeois society. I'm gonna contrast this with what Thomas Jefferson, the chief author of the Declaration of Independence says. He says, the human mind is created free by the almighty. So I hope you can see that a, human, that a political theorist like Marx, who doesn't believe we're free, who doesn't think your mind is free, obviously, therefore, he has no reason to worry about a government that protects intellectual freedom, freedom of conscience, freedom of choice. He thinks you're changeable. Therefore, he does, his theory, his political theory, does not have to accommodate itself to what I would take to be a key facet of human nature, namely that we love ourselves. Okay. Human nature is malleable. We're historical beings. I think that's really important. Marx is fairly clear. He wants to change us. If you've ever studied the Soviet Union, you'll know that one of the chief undertakings there was to try to create something called the new Soviet man, trying to create different new people. And it's not just, by the way, stuff, and it's not just our thought. This new Soviet man, these new communist men, it strikes near and dear to the heart of what most of us, I think, suspect are actually intimately bound up with human nature. And that's the family. What about the abolition of the family? Marx concedes, you're right. I do want to abolish the family. And why does he want to abolish the family? He says, look at the 19th century. Think about the 19th century. Think about the role of women in the 19th century. Think about children in the 19th century. He's like, do you think women are happy? Are they free? They can't divorce their husbands if they've been abused. They are not allowed to own property. They have no power. Children are treated as property. They're made to work. Wouldn't we be better off if we could take care of the children? And his primary um, policy recommendation actually is public education. Marx thinks that public education would be better for children and would raise, it would enable them better to live uh, fully flourishing human lives. So he does want to get rid of private property. He does want to get rid of the family. And third, he also wants to get rid of the nation. Here, I think, let me try and, and impress this just a little bit. So he'll say, for example, to a proletariat in Italy, you think your real friends are your fellow Italians, even if they're bourgeois. The bourgeois Italians are not your friends. Your real friend, Italian proletariat, is the German proletariat, the English proletariat. Your country has duped you into believing that your ethnic or national ties are more important than your economic and social ties. And they're wrong. What we, we don't, we do wanna get rid of the nation, Mark says. We absolutely wanna get rid of the nation because what we want is for the workers of each country to recognize that their true allies are the workers of other countries. Again, the last line of the Communist Manifesto is, 
workers of the world unite. I'm gonna end with a couple of points in passing. This is at the end of part two, Marx gives uh, 10 policy prescriptions. It's probably worth discussing if you have the time. These are the things he would like communist countries to do or communist parties to support in the countries where they exist. And some of them are actually, I think, fairly non-objectionable. So number 10 is uh, free education and stop children working in factories. That sounds fine. Uh, number two is a graduated income tax, which by the way, we have in America right now. But number one is abolishing all property. Okay, that, that might be a, a problematic. Right after Marx lays out his policy descriptions, prescriptions, excuse me, he defines political power. Political power, according to Karl Marx, is merely the organized power of one class for oppressing another. Here again, I think you see the roots for all the later communist wars. All politics is, is oppression. Therefore, there's a great toleration for oppression, power, in Marxist communist thought. You can't get away from it. Rather, the only way you can get away from it is to eliminate class distinctions, which means to eliminate an entire class of people. Maybe this last slide will help bring out fully what I'm trying to say. I mentioned a little while ago that the chief political philosopher who influenced the Declaration of Independence was a man named John Locke. I hope you'll get some chance to read him. On the right, you'll see John Locke's definition of political power. On the left, you'll see Marx's. On the left, you see that political power is simply oppression. On the right, I hope you'll see that Locke defines political power as having limits. He says, political power then I take to be a right of making laws with penalties of death and consequently all less penalties for the regulating and preserving of property and of employing the force of the community in the execution of such laws and in the defense of the commonwealth from foreign injury and all this only for the public good. So you see in Locke and in liberal thought later, there's an idea that there is some public good. There is a, a community good that different classes can come to. There's a common good. The rich and poor actually might have some good in common. That's denied in Marx. There's no possibility of a common good in Marx. It's just one class oppressing another. And Locke's like, well, hey, you know, different classes might have some over areas of overlap where there's some common. A couple of other things. Hopefully you're seeing the limits. It's, it's, it can only be for the public good. If it's not for the public good, it's not political power. I don't think Locke is being silly here. Locke recognizes that there's oppression in the world. Locke would just refuse to call that oppression political. Last point here, political power for Locke must regulate and preserve property. This seems to be grist for Marx's mill because Marx said, all you guys care about is money. And that would seem to, to sort of confirm what Marx had said earlier, that all these liberals care about is money. But it's important to note, and I would encourage you to double check me if you think I'm wrong, that Locke defines property first and foremost as your life and your liberty, that which is most properly you. So for Locke, political power must protect your life. Why is it so hard for people to see that in Marx, there is no similar protection for the sanctity of human life? Marx denies that that is possible. For Locke, it's essential for good government for there to be the protection of life, liberty, and your stuff. I'm not gonna deny that's not part of it, but it comes third in order. So this, it's so neat that they define, I mean, it's so clear. I think I, this is about the clearest juxtaposition I can see between liberal thought of John Locke and the communist thought of Karl Marx. I was told to leave a few minutes uh, for questions in the chat if there are. So at this point, I'll wrap up. I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. McBear. That was very, that was great. That was clear. Um, and, and a lot of questions, I'm sure. Um, just uh, for, for our, our viewers, um, you, you did treat Marx seriously and you gave him his due and you talked about why um, he could be appealing. Um, if you would just say, um, you know, though, about why it would over time, you know, maybe it can get me to a certain point, but oh, I don't have any of my own stuff, or oh, I don't have my family. Um, how, how does it have staying power? And does that go back to some of the how power plays out even? Um, but but the appeal of it, 
um, that's, yeah. that's a question that comes up. That's a great question. So why is it persistently so appealing? I mean, in the first place, I think it continues to be appealing in the first place to very smart people who fancy themselves very, very smart. So it seems to still be very popular among academics. But I think the other reason it continues to be persuasive is, I mean, I think it's a general human tendency to think that if someone, if things aren't going very well and someone tells you things are awful and they could be better, that's always appealing. Marx promises, we don't, we didn't go into this much today, but Marx promises that the end communist state will be heaven on earth. You get to do whatever you want. And you know what? I mean, I, I live in, uh, I live in the middle of Ohio and I'm, I'm surrounded by a number of good friends who complain about how awful things are. And I can't help but think, you know, from a human perspective in the grand historical scheme of things, things are about as good as they could be. I mean, um, and so it's, it's difficult for people to appreciate how well things are going. I think that's part of it. So part of the appeal is always anybody who thinks that they're um, on the low end of society, here's a voice for you. He's always willing to speak to you. I think that's a big part of it. I, I think there, another big part of its attraction is that it tries to explain history in simple terms that can, and I realize it probably didn't come across as very simple, but that there is a purpose to history that's appealing to people, I think, that there's a clear direction that things are getting better. And so I think that even a, a good, well-meaning someone who believes in our regime could be like, well, yeah, of course, we, we arrived at this point in history. We had a good regime. And what's next will be even better. And, and that's there, too, that there's something always better out there. I think there are certain types of human being for whom that's always appealing. Yeah. And you've talked about how there were some different factors that came together at the time that the Communist Manifesto appeared. Do you think that Marxism, especially as we know it um, through the Communist Manifesto, would have been the same if it had been written 100 years before or 100 years after? Or is there something about that time frame that gives rise to Marxism? That's a great question. I do think there is a, this almost sounds Marxist to explain it that way, but there is something about that particular historical situation, I think. So I think that, look, I'm a firm believer in the goodness of um, a freedom, a freedom based regime and freedom, especially of political, but also economic rights. But I think in the middle of the 19th century, what you saw was uh, some of the excesses of liberalism. And what you, what you would so, saw 100 years later was liberalism's response to its own excesses and it corrected itself. And so I think later you wouldn't have seen such a radical critique of this regime. And earlier, 100 years earlier, I don't think you would have seen yet uh, the kinds of um, real exploitation that was made possible by industrialization. I don't think you'd have seen that in the 1750s or something like this. Yeah, right. that's a very good question. And then um, we have one more question from the chat. Uh, so you, you mentioned both him constructing a political theory, but you also mentioned a political ideology. So, so one yeah. of the students is asking, was he a philosopher? That's a great question. Uh, Marx thought of himself as a scientist. He thought that he was doing a science of history. He thought that, it, as I mentioned, he sort of thought that history plays out in this way that one can understand. And so therefore he thought that he had understood scientifically how to understand the ways in which history would unfold. And one of the things that he thought that he foresaw was that there would be this worldwide communist revolution. I, myself, I would not give to Marx the high title of philosopher. That's because I'm very stingy with that title. I tend to give it only to those people who I think have understood something fundamentally about the human condition. And I think that Marx, although he diagnosed some of the problems in a way that I think is correct. I think he fails to understand human beings as they are. And I think he therefore fails to understand the world as it is. So I would, I would be reluctant to give him that. But ideologue, no problem. Of course, funny enough, that's a Marxist term. Right, right. And, and ideologue rather than scientists, though, in the end? Oh, yes, of course. I'm sorry. He called himself. <laughs> maybe I should have emphasized that. I, I'm even doubtful that there is such a thing as a science of history, yes. But he thought he was a scientist. And I think that that's probably gravely mistaken. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. McBear, and thank you thank all you, for joining us today. Uh, please visit VOC's website to learn more about our programs. Uh, we have a summer seminar for high school and uh, middle school uh, students. You can see, uh, for teachers rather, you can see the dates here. Um, please go to our website to, to learn more about that program. You can also learn on our website about our expanded and new curriculum for high school and middle school
students, our award-winning uh, Witness Project video series, uh, and the museum. Um, and you can also donate to uh, VOC on our website as a small educational nonprofit. We are grateful for your support. It's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much.